Hello everyone, welcome back to our traditional archery and bow hunting 101 series of videos. Today we're going to be talking about various bow terms and terminology that you may hear people uh, use when they're talking about or how, describing a bow or maybe telling you things you need to do to tune the bow. So we're going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, I'm using a longbow here for this demonstration uh, and to talk about these terms, but all of, everything I'm going to say here applies to uh, straight limb style bows like this, hybrid uh, or reflex deflex style bows, uh, long bows, and recurves as well. The terms apply to all of them. So the first thing we'll talk about is brace. And you'll often hear the term, the bow is at brace, or you need to do this at brace height. And all that means is the bow is strung and ready to shoot. Um, there's no pressure being applied. It's not unstrung. It's just like you see it here. It's, that is braced and ready to shoot. The biggest thing you'll hear referred to uh, regarding brace is brace height. And brace height is a measure from the back of the riser to the string. It's as simple as that. And that comes into tuning your bow. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit uh, as we go forward. And I am going to do a video on tuning your bow and tuning your arrows in the future. You will need a bow scale. Um, I would highly recommend you go ahead and buy one of these. You can measure using a tape measure, but you're gonna need one of these enough that it just justifies buying it. They're not very expensive, and I'll throw a link to a, a, an effective but cost-effective one at the end of the, or in the show notes of this video. To measure the brace height, you wanna take your bow scale and press it against the deepest part of the handle. So this bow has a fairly straight handle. There's a little bit of a dish here. It could have a, a more of a hill dish style uh, handle, or it could be a locator uh, grip like you'd see on a recurve. But you always measure from the deepest part of that uh, grip. So we're gonna put that here, and then you put the scale against the string. This one's six and a quarter inches currently. It's probably a little low, but that's how you measure the brace height. Each bow uh, will have a recommended brace height. You can reach out to the, the boyer or the manufacturer. If that's not possible, then you can ask in various uh, Facebook groups, social media forums. You can find somebody that can tell you what they would recommend. It's usually going to be a range, so it might be six and a quarter to six and three quarters inches of brace height. Uh, you'll have to fine tune it for your setup because each bow is different and each arrow setup is different. Um, but once you get the, the arrow tuned fairly well based on the, the weakness of the arrow, and talk about that in just a second, then you can fine tune by adjusting that brace height. But typically it's going to be in that range. Also, typically recurves are going to have a much higher brace height than a longbow. So longbows are gonna be around the six and a half inches. Uh, recurves can go up into the eight inch range at times. So um, just again, ask the, the boyer or um, uh, manufacturer what that should be or consult uh, other archers that may have the same style bow. Next, real quick, we'll talk about um, the riser. And the riser is pretty much everything that you see up until the point where the limbs start to bend when the bow is strung. Um, so in this case, it would be something like here. And that includes the grip. The next part of the riser that you'll often hear referred to, and one that threw me off for a while, I didn't know what people are talking about, is the fades. And you'll hear people refer to in the fades or at the fades. And that is this part of the handle where it starts to taper down into the limb. This is the fade. It fades from the riser into the limb. The next part you'll hear people talk about in the riser is the shelf. Um, the shelf is basically just where the arrow rests when you're going to shoot it. Some self bows don't have a rest. And in that case, you'll hear people talking about shooting off the knuckle. And that just means that they're letting the, the arrow sit on their hand as they're shooting and they, that's their rest. But most bows are going to have a shelf of some sort. When you're hearing uh, people talk about the shelf, you'll often hear them refer to as the shelf cut to center. Is it cut past center or is it negative of center? All that's referencing is where the riser is cut or how deep the shelf is cut in the riser in relation to the string. If it's cut in even with the string, that's cut to center. If it's cut past the point where the string is, then that's cut past center. And if it's not quite cut that deep, that's negative of center. And that is important when it comes to choosing your arrow shafts. Um, a, a bow that's not cut quite to center is going to need a weaker spined arrow uh, to clear the riser when you're shooting it 
One that's cut to center or past center, you can get away with a much stiffer spine because the arrow doesn't have to bend as much to clear the riser. And I'm going to talk about Archer's Paradox in just a minute. Um, some bows, especially modern uh, recurves where they may have a metal riser, can have a, uh, a, a threaded adapter where you can install an elevated rest, but you won't see a lot of that in the typical traditional archery community. In fact, some people frown upon it. I really don't care. Uh, I prefer to shoot off the shelf, but in some cases you may see somebody with a, an elevated rest uh, which has the arrow above the shelf on the bow. So just keep that in mind. Now I mentioned Archer's Paradox. If you're not familiar with that term, what Archer's Paradox is, is when you draw the bow back and you release the bow, as the arrow absorbs the energy from the string when you release, it's going to flex, and that flex is called Archer's Paradox. And it's important because for the arrow to shoot the most accurately, that arrow has to flex just right so that it clears the riser and doesn't touch anything. If the arrow is too stiff, then it'll ramp or slide along that riser a little bit and it'll make it shoot more to the left or to the right, depending on if you're a right or left-handed shooter. And if the arrow is too weak, it'll flex too much and as it comes back, it'll hit the riser before it clears the bow. Um, one of the few times Hollywood got anything right in, uh, in an archery uh, movie or where archery was included in a movie is in the kids' movie Brave. And I'm gonna put a link to a, another video on YouTube that'll show you just that clip of the movie if you haven't already seen it. But it does a really great job of showing what Archer's Paradox looks like as that arrow is leaving the bow and it's flexing and bending around that riser. And that's why tuning a bow is so important. When you get your arrows tuned right to clear that riser, then you can adjust this brace height to fine tune and get everything just right. So that's why all this comes together. And again, we'll do a video on tuning um, very soon and in the future. So that's all the components to the bow that I really want to talk about today. Um, one term you'll hear often is AMO, or you may hear AMO length, and AMO stands for Ar Archery Manufacturers Organization, and it's just a set of standards. You'll hear to a, a bow referred to in length, like this is a 68 inch bow, and it would be a 68 inch AMO standard bow. And that's measured with the bow unstrung or unbraced from the knot groove to the knot groove, and that'll give you the AMO length. The reason it's important is because the AMO standard says for the string that's on the bow, it needs to be three inches shorter than the AMO length of the bow. And that doesn't matter if it's uh, long bows or recurves. The AMO standard states length of the bow minus three inches is the string length. Now with some recurves especially, you'll find that you might need or want a shorter string, and a lot of times it's even four inches shorter, but the standard is three inches. Um, the best way I can tell you is once you have a bow shooting right, you know what the brace height is, you can take that string off, put it under some pressure and measure from tip to tip, and then if you, when you have to order a new string, you know what that length needs to be. Um, so that pretty much covers the, um, the, the, uh, the brace height. The, um, the AMO length. I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, the last part about the bow I want to talk about is one that's confusing sometimes, and that's the term knock. The knock can mean several different things. There is a knock on the arrow, which is the part that snaps onto the string. There is a knocking point, which you will use your bow scale for, to determine where that knock point needs to always sit on the string when it's attached to the bow. There is a knock that goes on the string that prevents the knock of the arrow from sliding up and down. This is why this term can get confusing. So when somebody says the knock, you just have to understand what part of this, this terminology around knock they're specifically talking about. Is it the knock on the arrow? Is it the knocking point or the knocks that create the knocking point on the string? Or it could even be the knocks on the end of the bow. That's whether these grooves are for the string to rest on the, the end of the limb of the bow is also called a knock. So a lot of different uses for that term. Just under, make sure you understand what each one of them are and then you'll be less confused. Last thing we're going to talk about is strings. Now, when it comes to traditional archery, there are really two types of strings. There are endless loop strings and there are Flemish twist strings. And I'm going to put a little video up in the corner that does a close-up of these and shows you exactly what they are. For all intents and purposes, they will both shoot the same. They both provide virtually the same performance. It's a matter of preference as to which one 
you may want. I will prefer and like Flemish twist strings. Um, I think they're a little bit easier um, to, to adjust for your bow. They can be made a lot more pleasing to the eye than a endless loop can because you can use multiple colors and create patterns in the string. Um, and I think you can make them fine tune them a little bit better to the bow so that you have the best number of strands and can create the lightest string, which is going to give you a little bit better performance. But again, it's marginal. It doesn't make a difference. And the, the Flemish twist is created by taking two or more bundles of strands of string. You twist each bundle one direction and then counter twist the two bundles on top of each other. And that's how you come up with a Flemish twist. There's no knots in this string, but those twists back and forth keep everything together and hold it in place as you're uh, stringing and shooting the bow. With an endless loop, it's just what it sounds like. You're making a big loop out of the various strands until you get the number of strands that you want, and then you use serving material to serve and create the loops on the end. Um, both types of strings, you'll want to know how to adjust the brace height by shortening these strings. Um, regardless of whether it's a Flemish twist or an endless loop, you twist the string so that you create more twists in the string to shorten it. To lengthen the string, you untwist it so you've got less twists in the string. With an endless loop, once the string is make, it made, it can't be made any longer. That is as long as it's going to be. It will stretch a little bit, but not much. So you can't make one of these strings longer um, once it's new by untwisting it, but you can make it shorter by twisting and putting more twist in the string. With a Flemish twist, it's going to come with some twist already in, which you can probably see here by these twists in the string. To make it shorter, you twist it and add more twist. To make it longer, you can untwist it, but be very careful, especially on a new string, because you can't, um, you can only go so far untwisting it before you go too far and weaken the string. So if the string is not long enough, contact your, your string maker who made the string for you and let them know this and adjust the length of the string. You don't want to un twist these too much. They can't come apart. That's it for this video. Um, again, I've mentioned several other topics that we're going to get to on future videos. If there's anything in this video that is unclear, please leave a comment below and I'll do my absolute best to either address it in the comments or I'll address it in a future video. Until then, get out there and get shooting. Thank you so much, everyone.